good to see you this morning. And I love the creativity that is growing with us as we take step by step. The flower this morning, the flowers this morning are from, from the Sarm family. They actually seem to be from their yard. Since we aren't ordering flowers yet, they're in honor of their daughter Jillian's birthday. And I like that we are taking step by step as we figure out how to adapt our church together to what we can do. And thank you, Sarms, for showing us one next step together. And as we remember Jillian's life, her birthday, and give thanks for her presence with us. She's not physically present with us today because she lives out of state, but we can remember her with, her with the beauty of these flowers. The um, grace notes will be available in a moment. They're just being printed if you haven't seen them online. And I will be on vacation the next few weeks. And Joyce Salter will be available to connect anyone with a pastor on call. Should you become aware of a pastoral, urgent pastoral need in the time of my being away. Her phone number is listed on the grace notes. Does anyone else have an announcement to share in this time? If not, let us turn now to the prelude with Kevin. Getting up and down out of lawn chairs is different than out of regular chairs, so please use your judgment about whether you want to do that. Rise as your people. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Is that better? Whoa. The first reading is from 1 Kings, chapter 3. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept from him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit in his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servants, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Word of the Lord. Gospel according to Matthew in the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in its field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sell all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On funding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, from his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Christ. Christ. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. Hearing again this wondrous story of Solomon and his prayer. I wonder if we ask God enough. Yes, I know. We are working on prayer in confirmation class right now. It's been important to me to talk with our young teens about the difference between saying thanks to God and asking for stuff. But to a person, they already got that. I also get it. I like to model our prayer together so that it's not just all, give me, give me, give me. You'll see today, even when our hearts are broken open with the pandemic, when we are struggling with many difficulties, there is still a place for expressing our trust in God, for at least that kind of praise, even in the most difficult circumstances. What Solomon's prayer makes me wonder is if we aren't bold enough in coming before God to ask for what is essential. That we let other things we hold on to and value block our path. I'd like to say that day after day I have chosen the right paths in following God willingly, selflessly, courageously, and generously. But you know, I'm human just like you. What I've learned is that I've grown most in faith and in other human qualities. I've grown most through difficulty and suffering. I haven't seen it in that moment. Usually it's taken some reflection after the fact, knowing that I've been held up through a hard season, coming to realize from where my strength has come. Most of us, I don't know, maybe it's all of us. Most of us do not choose difficulty when we have a choice. I wasn't conscious until a few years after our youngest son, Nate, was born about a kind of hierarchy of values in the family that I come from. Some of those values will be familiar to you. We share them. The value of hard work of family and thrift, of the strength of community and of working a garden. 
Because of the gift of our third child, I was forced to examine what I simply had passed over with pride with my older two children. What is perhaps my family's most important value? You really count in my family if you're smart in school. I never really had to look at that one before because I was. And so were my two older kids. From the beginning, our child, our third child, had difficulties on developmental testing. For his whole childhood, the evaluations would remind me every three months of what he was not, of how far from the norm he fell. Now the people doing the testing would always explain that the test can only measure certain things. But with my heritage, which was an invisible something, but so strong, it took me years to unhook the standards I had internalized in my family about how I perceived the world, and then how I valued about my son's value in the world. What makes us valuable? before God. Oh, I could speak all the right answers, but when my young child could not pass the developmental tests and began falling farther and farther behind, it took me years of grappling to let my heart be broken open, to grow big enough to let go of how my family defined success. What was essential for escaping poverty in post-depression Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where my parents are from, is one story. That's a survival story. But when it comes to a measuring stick for someone else's value, it cripples not only the one we judge, who comes to seem small in our eyes, and often invisibly so, as we are judging them but also we who judge, whose hearts become cramped in our judging. I didn't know I was judging in that way. Could not let myself see it. Not until my own toddler could not make his developmental milestones and kept falling farther behind. Then I was simply terrified for him. And it took me years to unpack it took me years of grappling to come to terms with this. I'm not proud to tell you this story. It's often hard for me to share it. I share it because it was only in letting go of this artificial standard of what he should be to be valuable. Something buried deep in myself but supported in our culture. That I could be truly open to all of who he is including his music, and find the right supports for cultivating it in a more oral tradition, for he learns completely by ear. Coming to this new understanding was a remarkable healing that I've been granted with this child. You see, he had to just stand still and be himself, for the healing was not at all about him, but about a distortion inside me that I could not locate the value of a person in something arbitrary that he'd been born with, rather than how he had cho chosen to use his gifts. When we were doing the pandemic sharing, I had this experience reading through your cards. For those of you who weren't there that day, we were sharing our struggles and difficulties of this time on one side of the cards and our joys on the other. I had asked you to write your names on your cards and many of you did. And many people shared poignantly on the one side what's distressing to you. Now, you won't be surprised on the hard issues around us, we're not all of one mind. And reading through casually the first time, I read one line on one card and I found myself reacting, oh no, that person believes that. The second thought I had, yes, after a pause, was, I don't. But I care deeply about that person. That seats us together at a table 
facing each other with Jesus at the table with us, where the ordinary pattern of our lives would not give us that blessing. That makes me think of watching the protests of these last months following George Floyd's death, which is still going on in some places. I'm thinking of some of their ugliest moments, moments captured on camera and then flashed up on our televisions, moments or pictures that no one would be proud to send home to grandma, faces contorted in rage, shouting, fists raised, sometimes with a weapon of some sort in hand, yelling at each other about whose life matters. Now, you know where I live, and I'm not going to pretend where my heart leans, but I'm not preaching aside. What I have wanted to do, if I could be out in the protests, which I have not been able to risk right now, given my responsibilities with Nate and with you, what I have wanted to do is to be able to step between the people that are raging with each other in a way that there is no solution, and to say, with no rage in my voice, wait, something is missing here. Yes, I am here on this side, but I wonder, have you heard that your life also matters to me? The writer Amy Tan once said of her elderly aunt, she's not hard of hearing. She's hard of listening. Like with my family inheritance, we come to these difficult encounters already knowing what the other side is trying to say so that we cannot listen. I wonder if we ask God enough or ask enough of each other. King Solomon stood before God. He didn't ask for strength or for a long life, not for winning the lottery or wealth in other ways, not for happiness around the corner or for health. But in the midst of the difficulties he faced, Solomon prayed for wisdom. These are difficult days. That was clear as from all our perspectives, we let our struggles roll off our tongues, out of our pens, and onto our cards. Then for what shall we pray? For what kind of healing? The Apostle Paul reminds us that in these moments, God's Holy Spirit is hearing us, hearing even our sighs too deep for words the places we know we need to grow and just don't know how yet. Grant us wisdom, O oh God. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.
I looked at the cards we filled out a couple of weeks ago, and then we looked in our hearts, and this is what we think of. Oh, Father, where are you in these endless days where fear, anxiety, and uncertainty are our daily bread? Where many have no bread and no job and no one to be with them. We feel surrounded by many dangers while we need to isolate and wonder if we will stay healthy. Where are you, Lord? It feels like you have abandoned us, yet we know you have not. But why is all of this happening? You see in ways we never can, Lord. What are you seeing? What is the good that will come of this? And so we do our best, while we cannot gather as we would like, while we cannot join song to you as we would like. We hope that all of the anger and unrest will melt away in understanding and people coming together for the good of all. Guide us, Lord, in how to be in what to do. Help us in our fear and our anxiety. Help us not to feel so alone. We trust in you because we are your people. At this dark time, we trust in you because we are your people. As always, we trust in you because we are your people. Then sharing the peace by putting our hands on our hearts. And the peace of Christ be with you always. And, also with also with you. and finding someone with your eyes, since we cannot uh, connect with each other in other ways. And uh, sharing it again. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace, Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.